Oh man, American Battlefield Trust, here we are in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And there's a Vicksburg place at least I haven't been to. This is the Vicksburg Civil War Museum right behind me. Um, I think Chris is going to be taking us through, Chris. Yeah, this is awesome. Charles Pendleton, who's the president and owner of this facility, has it right down here on Washington Street. You're overlooking the Yazoo uh, distribution canal. You can see a nine inch Dahlgren gun over here. He has set up one of the best collections, that private collections, into a museum that I have seen in my entire career. So we're gonna head right in the door here. Oh, I can't wait. Here's Charles behind the behind the desk. And as you, oh man, it looks you like walk, there's a lot here. Yeah, Gary, as you walk in, one of the things I like is his mission statement. Chris Bukowski behind the camera. Can you just take a quick look there? <laughs> and the mission statement, I think number, number five says it all. It says, make sure history speaks favorably of you. I think that's a really, really powerful statement. And as you move your way into here, and Gary's never been here. Uh -oh. so I found the photo case. Found, yeah. <laughs> well, this is where Gary will be for the next four hours and as we move on from him. Um, but what Charles has done is starts to tell you the story of the Civil War, but lets you decide what your, you know, your ultimate uh, interpretation will be. He gives you the ordinance of secession over here on this wall. We'll move our way through, we'll get in their own words, Confederates as well as Union soldiers, and then we will move our way over into Reconstruction. So it's really neat to, the way he set it up. But if you like stuff, you're in a place that you're going to be in heaven. Because as we move, move around here, he's got everything from the cab um, down here, which Chris is showing. You can see the, the iron, iron cattle troughs that are there to cripple the horses. You throw them down. They're also sometimes called blackjacks, curry combs. You've got the stakes um, up here, which is you can put the lead line in, throw that stake in the ground, and your horse will stay there and graze. And I just saw a hardy hat. I mean, they've got a lot going on here. A little bit of everything. Um, you have the alarm system of clack rattlers. Uh, kids would also play with these from time to time. And then he's also got, he's got um, the shoulder boards over here, the very, very impressive epaulets. Um, everything from a captain to a major to a brigadier general. Um, he's got a little bit of everything there. We're just walking around showing you. And as you move your way through, he also has a, a reconstructed original slave cabin. Oh my God. Um, so this cabin itself, uh, Charles told us the story. He went out to a local uh, Mississippi farm, went up to the gentleman and said, hey, you have this old slave uh, dwelling on your property. Can I have it? And the guy said, if you take it down, you can have it. And so he did, and he put it up in here. And uh, this does represent really the post-war, what it would look like um, if you were a newly, and free, newly freed slave. Um, and this would be a small house, usually it's with a- Pretty heavy inside. A dirt floor. It's a little bit dark in here. Dirt floor with a, a chimney that he had taken down, basically broken off into two separate rooms, uh, sleep on one side, have a small kitchen and living space in the other, and you could have a front door, a back door, as well as a porch. So it's a really great um, piece of history here that he picked up and moved right inside of, of his museum. So if you ever get a chance to come here to Vicksburg, you don't want to miss this because um, you're literally walking through a historical structure inside of a museum. So as we step out this way, he has a massive collection of Civil War art. <laughs> if you're a Civil War art aficionado, look no further. And it goes all the way back into a viewing room, which we're not going to interrupt those folks um, who are watching a video. And I mean, you have everything from more Kunstler to um, Keith John Rocco. Paul Strain and Rocco. <laughs> yeah. and, and of course you have Ulysses S. Grant. Chris Bukowski might be a fan of Ulysses S. Grant there behind the camera. Um, for Gary, Cemetery Hill at Gettysburg. We're only a thousand miles from there, but it's always in Gary's heart. <laughs> and as we move down into this area, I don't want to reveal this side of the room yet. We move our way over here, and as we move our way down this way, you can see all of his ink wells that he has here, writing implements, boxes. I mean, if you're into really any aspect of material culture here in the Civil War, he's got a little bit of everything for you. Um, we're going to be moving through the medical display next as Chris is panning here. Those are beautiful writing displays, ink wells, and then 
course, we have surgical instruments, sur surgical instruments that we have through here. Um, you know, he noticed that many of them are, are nearly complete collections, which is pretty impressive. He has an amputation kit down here below. Um, also have, you know, all of your medicines. Sometimes the medicines are, are the, the cure, but the cure is worse than the actual illness. When they give you things like mercury to try to purge your system, not a great idea. Um, and then as we keep moving forward through here, you can see medical syringes, you can see the probes that they would use, field kits, things to lance and bleeders. I mean, if you can think of it for, for Civil War uh, medicine, he has it. And even above our heads, he has a hospital bed. Um, so as you look up, there's one of the hospital beds, which we could recline in, um, here for the, for the soldier. He's another one down a little ways. Camp chairs. You don't usually see a lot of camp chairs still with their no, fabric. There's one just sitting out on the ground there, too. What I like, too, is a lot of it is accessible. It's yeah. either very close to you or it's right here. Yeah. Uh, over here, we've got uniforms. I mean, he has three federal uniforms right in a row. And, and what I like is... He has a display for everything, little little card on these displays, tell you this is a double-breasted officer's coat. Um, he's going to give you the idea that, you know, here's your, your officer's belt buckle, 1851. You know, he has the epaulets up on here. So this is a little more of a dress uniform. We have more of what looks like an officer's sack coat. Not exactly an officer's sack, kind of a mixture of a frock and a sack here. And then, of course, we have the normal frock coat beside it. Um, so he gives you a little bit of everything um, if you're interested. But I know what a lot of our viewers are interested in, and that will be small arms. And unfortunately, he only has one or two guns on display here. Uh, so oh my God. you're not, you're not going to have uh, a field day with, with, with firearms. No, I'm completely joking with you. This entire wall stretching around us are rare weapons, some more common, but mostly rare. What Charles Pendleton, the owner here of the Vicksburg Civil War Museum, wanted to do was collect one of every Civil War firearm. And he's well on his way. I want to show you a couple of my favorites. Over on this side, Chris, we have the police model pistols. So if you think of small pistols, usually 31, 32, 36 calibers, um, these would be carried uh, sometimes by the police. Um, they are the smaller versions of our 44 caliber Remingtons or 44 caliber Colts that people know about, uh, the more common guns of the Civil War. And believe me, he's got one or two of those as well. But these are really compact um, and they, they pack a punch, and they'll give you the, the nice idea. Many of them are engraved, as you can see along here. Um, the bluing on some of them have obviously worn off over 100 years, but it's just one after another after another. And he tells you, you know, it's a 36 caliber, five shot, and he also has 78,000 of these are made. You know, here's your octagonal barrels. And he gives you a little bit of information on everything. So it's not just a collection. He's, he's telling you more about this material culture. Another thing that, that you know, I've collected over the years are these single shot guns. Um, these could be carried in your boot, boot pistols. They could also be carried by women um, and they would carry them in their mufflers, which would keep your hands warm. And these guns were simply, as we would call them, gut busters. As you would come up to a man um, who might be trying to assault you, you stick it right in his gut, you pull the trigger, one shot usually would do the job to get him away from you. But we also have double barrel of these single shot, uh, single trigger uh, guns here. And these are really, really cool uh, implements you see. What's also neat about some of them, we have what looks like pistols without triggers. Well, some of them don't have a trigger guard. If we look here at the Allen and Th uh, Thurber, uh, the second one up there, you might notice that it looks just like a hammer on top of a curved pipe. Uh, well, it's actually, when you pull back the hammer, the trigger itself will drop down. So it's a hidden drop trigger. So you pull it, trigger drops down. When you pull the trigger, it will go right back up into the gun. So that way, it won't hurt you. Um, or you won't discharge the, the gun prematurely. Um, it, so it lacks a trigger guard, which you can see on many of these other guns. On the other side, this is something I rarely get to see, and it is an Elgin Cutlass pistol. It's a single shot pistol with legitimately a cutlass on the end of it. So you can stab a person and shoot them, or you can shoot them 
then stabbed them. This is a naval pistol. There's a very small number of these in existence. I think this is maybe the third one I've ever seen. Um, and, and it's a really rare piece, an awesome piece of uh, naval history, especially for firearms. Uh, most people think, you know, the Navy's just shooting big guns. Well, think about some of those Errol Flynn movies you may have seen in the past. They were a little bit swashbuckling at times too during the Civil War. And an another piece that's not a firearm before we get to the, the long arms is something that uh, is another rare piece that Charles just acquired recently. And that is a pike ordered by John Brown. Wow the abolitionist um, who will take over the Harper's Ferry Federal Arsenal in 1869 or 1859. And this is one of the pikes that he ordered to arm newly freed slaves that he was trying to have during his slave revolt. He didn't figure many of them knew how to use firearms, so he figured the simplest and quickest way to arm them would be to give them pikes. Pikes are an ancient style weapon, simple to use, so he had a large number of them uh, created, and Charles just received one of these. This is, again, one of maybe two or three I've ever seen in my life. Harper's Ferry has one. Um, the Civil War Collection in Philadelphia had one. He has one. I just, I just want to add that, you know, so here we are in this museum in Vicksburg. There's another Civil War museum here. You might know about at the old courthouse. You might know about the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. You see the one at the Gettysburg Visitor Center. We just released a video not long ago about uh, at the Confederate Memorial Hall Museum. You got the Smithsonian. You got everything. I mean, you go to these places and they all have different emphases and different stuff. And I don't know if you're a stuff person. I never get tired of it for one. I'm into stuff. And as you can tell, if you've watched any of our other videos from like the Horse Soldier and other places we've gone through, I love to, to get my hands on these and see them. And if I can, just real quick, I just keep seeing so many things that I see in Civil War photos. Not only the camp chairs, but I saw some of the things they ate with. I saw the pots that they cook with. Like these these things like just bring life to the photographs and to the stories that we hear. Now and you you're, go. And you're going to say, show us everything. And I'm going to say, come to Vicksburg Civil War Museum so you could see it for yourself. Boom. We can't give everything away. But I want to show you just a, a few more items before we let you go on this video. These are some rare percussion pistols. They're actually flint locks. Uh, most of these are made over in Great Britain. Um, they're really interesting. You're also seeing a mixture of some that will have percussion caps, but you're seeing essentially a three barrel, which you can consider a mini volley gun um, with a flint lock hammer system. Um, very early 1800s that would be made, very ornate. And sometimes you can actually unscrew the barrels from these guns. Um, these ones don't look like they, they can, and then you can load them and then screw them back together. But another interesting one is this box lock belt pistol. Another uh, kind of a gut buster, as, as I call it. But on it, you can see that there's a mini bayonet that's spring-loaded. So in case you fire your, your round and you still are in trouble, you can actually push a little device and out will flip this mini bayonet and it turns it into a, a mini uh, knife for you. To, to finish off, as we move through here, we've got edged weapons. We have got rare muscatoons, um, a ton of edge weapons if you're into these. He's got everything from the 1850 foot and field op uh, foot officer sword to the field officer swords. He's got cab swords, basically cutlasses in here. Off to Chris Mikowski's right is uh, muscatoons. Um, you can see a tower muscatoon. This is made in Great Britain, um, which is a really cool piece. It looks a, a lot like an Enfield, but much smaller. And it has the ability to put a large saber bayonet on the side of it. You'll notice that this device on the side of it is a socket to, in, to put a socket bayonet on top of it. It would be one of those large, basically 13 inch sabers that go on the end of, of the gun. Up here, we also have some smooth bores, uh, muscatoons. You can tell that they're smooth bores by the second band that's up here on the end. But what's interesting about this cab muscatoon is that if you take your ramrod out, there's actually a device so that the ramrod slides up and is on a pivot system that it will go up into your gun. You'll load it because it's a breech loader from the front. And then when you withdraw your rammer, it's not free from in your hand that you could drop. It's still attached to the gun and you just flip it right underneath and return it to its home. So that's one of the innovations. And you can also see that on the top with the, the cab musketoon that's up there made in the Springfield Armory. Armory. Down here, we have a number of carbines. He has got an amazing carbine collection. 
probably the coolest one that he has in this case, and that's saying a lot, is this third model Trancher revolving rifle. We hear a lot about the uh, Colt revolving rifles that were during the Civil War. They look like a big, long rifle, just like a Colt pistol. Um, and there were other manufacturers who made revolving rifles. They never worked quite that well. You could have chain fires, which meant whenever you fired the thing, all of the rounds would go off at once. Some, they were hard to reload. So yeah, maybe you have six shots, but how long is it gonna take you to reload between the next six shots that you're gonna fire? But this is a really rare, um, this one's a five shot here, um, 42 caliber, really neat. We have an early, uh, early model, Ballard carbine that also has a breech loading mechanism, much like the bolt action that you'll see on a 1903 Springfield right here. So we are uh, just down, you know, what, 40 years before we see those 1903 Springfields um, and, you know, about 30 years before we see the, the Mausers come out like that. Um, a bunch of other guns. I don't want to show you everything and bore you, but he's got everything from percussion. He's got guns made in the war in 1863 in Norfolk, Virginia. He is also has Colt rifles. Yes, Colt also manufactured rifles. And we have Spencer carbines, anything else you can think of. And then of course, the wall of artillery shells. <sighs> it was fired out of an artillery tube or a cannon tube. He probably has it on his wall. Gary? I, I just want to express again, I've only been here for a few minutes, but it's north, south, it's white, black, it's soldier, civilian, it's home front, it's politics. It's really an impressive collection and there is a lot in here considering the size of the space. Yeah, wow. you could take a, a good part of your day just reading, looking, if you're an arms person like I am, if you're a material culture person like I am, this is the place to come. So check out the Vicksburg Civil War Museum. Again, we wanna thank Charles Pendleton, who's the owner, the president of this museum. It's right down on Washington Street here in Vicksburg. You're overlooking the Yazoo Canal. It's a great chance to get from the battlefield down here into the town, which is a real hidden gem in and of itself. And Gary, anything you want to add? No, I think this is it. What a, what a great treat that we're allowed to just uh, go in here today and that uh, this is my first visit here. I'll definitely spend some more time after we shoot. Yeah, absolutely. And on behalf of the American Battlefield Trust, Gary Edelman, Chris Mikowski behind the camera, thank you to Charles Pendleton, thank you to the Vicksburg Civil War Museum, and thank you to the members and supporters of the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you for supporting battlefield preservation and education.